1930s saw the birth of modern Grand Prix motor racing. In England, the sport was a hobby for the rich, but in Germany, Hitler used motor racing as powerful propaganda, a way of demonstrating to the world the Reich's engineering supremacy. Under his control, Germany produced racing cars that annihilated all opposition. These cars, called the Silver Arrows, became invincible gladiators across the racetracks of Europe. Closely guarded, no outsider was allowed near them, except for one, a young English racing driver called Richard Seaman. He was Britain's most successful racing driver of the pre-war era, but today he is unknown, written out of history because he raced for the Germans. And the crowning moment of his career was celebrated with a Nazi salute. Only after Germany's defeat in 1945 was the story of Richard Seaman and the Silver Arrows remembered. As British intelligence agents searched Stuttgart for Germany's industrial secrets, they came across some blueprints, reminders of how the lure of German engineering ensnared one of Britain's most talented drivers. The cars at the center of Richard Seaman's story were Germany's finest. Built by Mercedes and Auto Union, their engineering inspired British designers up until the 1960s. Before the war, the specifications of the Silver Arrows had been kept secret. They had been manufactured by the same workshops making Hitler's armaments. Prized by the Nazi regime, the German racing teams had orders to destroy the Silver Arrows rather than let them fall into foreign hands. When they raced, onlookers had been kept away. You couldn't get near the pits. We were all behind curtains on that one. Very hush hush. Oh, absolutely. You wouldn't let us know what was going on. Yet, despite the security, the young Englishman Richard Seaman was chosen to drive the Third Reich's closely guarded secret. I should think Seaman himself was sworn to secrecy completely and uh, never dare break it, that rule. The story of Richard B.T. Seaman has remained largely hidden from British history. He was born in 1913 into a family with wealth and status. His father had made a fortune from the distilleries business and owned a vast estate in the country and a house in Knightsbridge. He was the product of a very elderly father who'd married very much younger but nonetheless widowed lady and she was a rather grand lady in her own right. And she's been described as a, as a grand dame of the stiffest corset. Young Dick grew up with one ambition, to be a racing driver. Fairly typically of boys of his class and his period, he barely knew his parents while he was growing up. They were hoping that he would go into the diplomatic service and then he'd eventually run for parliament and he'd become a, 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 an MP. So, in September 1926, Dick's father dispatched him first to rugby school and then to Cambridge. But Dick's driving ambition spared little time for academic work or the wishes of his parents. Dick had this daily resolve and sometimes he treated his parents pretty badly because he just ran roughshod over their wishes in order to do what he wanted and become a successful racing driver. Dick lent on his rich parents to fund his plans to race. At 21, he persuaded his mother to buy him another car. He didn't tell her it was for racing. Seaman already was a promising driver then. And then he went on from strength to strength. Yes, he was a very fine driver, race driver. Very calm and collected. Knew what he was doing. Dick's professional attitude was out of step with the amateurism of the sport. Motor racing in England remained a hobby for the rich. 
people just go down there and pay at the gate to go in and perhaps take a picnic lunch with them. People used to dress nicely for the occasion, especially the ladies. It wasn't quite Ascot, but um, modelled a little bit like that. Dick set his sights high. Even early in his career, he looked to make his mark outside England and began competing on the continent. He very quickly learned that because it was a profession in Europe, there was money to be made there. So from the very start with his first MG, he went racing abroad. In the 1930s, motor racing was more dangerous than today. There were very few regulations or safety precautions. Very soon, the worry of Dick's racing began to drive a wedge between his parents. Dick's father grew so concerned that Mrs. Beatty Seaman now began to hide from him any news of Dick's motor racing, often saying that he had gone off travelling or shooting. His mother was incredibly indulgent. His invalid father was worried about what Dick was going to do, what was going to become of Dick. The notion that somebody should actually um, consider dedicating their life to a sport was complete anathema to it. As Dick's passion for motor racing grew, at home his father became more disappointed in him. My dear boy, when are you going to settle down to your career and take it seriously? You know we always hoped that you would read for the bar and stand for parliament or be trained for the diplomatic service. Motor racing's neither here nor there. It's just a sport and amusement and leads to nothing. In Germany, attitudes towards racing couldn't have been more different. There, to race was considered an honor and motor racing was about to undergo a revolution. When Adolf Hitler became Chancellor in 1933, the car became central to his vision of a new Germany. Hitler was absolutely fascinated by technology, and he thought that technical advance would be at the core of his kind of utopian vision of what Germany was going to be. Um, and this covered absolutely everything, cars, roads, armaments, uh, all areas of modern technical development. Unlike Britain, where motor racing received no financial help, Hitler allocated 500,000 Reichmarks a year to go towards the Mercedes racing program. But then along came a man who would revolutionize the sport. His name was Professor Ferdinand Porsche, and he created a rival company called Auto Union. Ferdinand Porsche was essential to uh, his fellow Austrian, Hitler, in the 1930s, not only in, in helping to develop really high-powered cars, but because he was the man that Hitler chose, of course, to produce the famous people's car, the Volkswagen. On the 10th of May, 1933, Dr. Porsche arranged a meeting with Hitler and unveiled his own plans for a new racing car. Hitler was so impressed, he now split the 500,000 Reichmarks destined for Mercedes with Auto Union. Hitler now pitted the two companies against each other. The fierce competition between Mercedes and Auto Union pushed engineering to new heights and set the template for the modern racing car. The Finnish Mercedes was shown to Hitler in January 1934 and the Auto Union car was presented to him two months later. Together, the two rival cars would be known as the Silver Arrows. With Hitler's financial encouragement, they stood ready to take on the world. In Britain, Dick continued to receive disapproval from his father and funding only from his mother's checkbook. But he had just one ace up his sleeve. His father's ill health meant his mother controlled the purse strings. However much he disliked him racing, Dick knew he could play upon her conscience. Dick Seaman was Mrs. Beatty Seaman's only son, and she absolutely doted on him. And she worried herself sick that he was going to hurt himself. But essentially, he could twist around his little finger. 
Dick even persuaded his mother to buy him his own plane. Thinking it would distract him from racing, she obliged, but he used it to fly to the racetracks of Europe. In Switzerland, Dick won his first major victory, the Prix de Berne, but his success was overshadowed by the tragic death of one of his fellow drivers. The team was severely shaken and shortly afterwards disbanded. When Dick's aged father read about the accident, he got confused and thought it was Dick who had died. He suffered a heart attack and went into care. There was a degree of um, selfishness and self-obsession and uh, self-interest, which seems unattractive now, but Dick was going to be a racer, and he decided very early on that he was going to be a racer, and a racer he became. His racing was breaking his parents, but he had no intentions of giving up. Dick was ready for the fast track. abroad had fueled Dick's need to win. In 1935 he looked for a faster car, but he was still reliant on his mother for cash. Dick no longer hid his intentions. This time he asked for £2,000 and told her it was for a new racing car. Under pressure from her husband she refused. Under more pressure from her son she relented. Another check was written. and another car was bought. This time, Dick became the owner of Britain's finest racing car. ERA were the creation of Raymond Mays, who had a reputation for winning. Mays was quite a good racing driver himself, a brilliant entrepreneur. And Mays produced a number of these cars for private buyers, of whom Dick became one. Dick was competitive, and now with the ERA team, he was expecting to win. But in race after race, his ERA suffered from engine trouble. Dick quickly realized that he was getting second best. And what Mays had not reckoned with was a very shrewd racing brain, a very ambitious young man, and a very pampered young man who was not used to being given second best. Dick's attitude was wearing the patience of Raymond Mays and breaking the patience of his father. When he discovered his wife had handed over £2,000 for another racing car, he threatened to write him out of his will and set off to London to stop Dick from racing ever again. But it was too late. His father collapsed and died the following day. Mr. Beatty Seaman did threaten to write Dick out of his will if he didn't give up racing. And I think he meant it. He, he was distressed by Dick's racing, certainly. Thought he was wasting his life, basically. His father's death did nothing to sway him from racing. But throughout the year, Dick's ERA was plagued with problems and he missed races. Exasperated, Dick flew to Monaco to watch the Grand Prix. The German teams were competing with their new cars. Here, he came face to face with the kind of motor racing he had always dreamed of. Dick wrote, The performance of the Mercedes team was amazing. The three cars arrived together with plenty of time to spare and were placed with their backs to the pits at exactly the same angle and the same distance apart. Each car had two mechanics, who arranged the pit about a quarter of an hour before the start. The whole performance was like a PT squad at the Royal Tournament. When he first saw the new Mercedes Grand Prix cars in 1935, he was seeing not only remarkably sophisticated cars that were beautifully built, but he was seeing an expression of the new Germany. Dick had seen perfection. The German teams embodied everything he was struggling to achieve. When he returned to England, his car failed him yet again. Well, Seaman wasn't going to put up 